I will tell you a bit, little bit about my research, and my field of research is algebraic geometry. So uh, that's a, an area of uh, modern mathematics that has links to a variety of other um, areas. Uh, so on the one end, it's related to mathematical physics, say, and on a completely different sort of end of the spectrum, it's related to problems in number theory, so problems about uh, prime numbers, divisibility, and so on. And uh, what I personally find exciting about this field is that there, there is a uniform language of, that allows you to talk about very different problems. And what that implies is that ideas from mathematical physics pass through this field and get applied in number theory, and, and really vice versa. So people uh, say working with prime numbers, they can have insights that will be useful for people in uh, mathematical physics. Um, so to start, uh, who do, how many of you know what an algebraic variety is? Almost nobody. Great. So you're in for a treat. Uh, I'm going to tell you what an algebraic variety is. And, uh, a few words about their topology, and in the end, I will say a few words about my own research. Okay, so, so what is an algebraic variety? So we always start with a field. So that's a field of coefficients. So here on the right, you have examples. So k could be the complex numbers. That's, that's our favorite field. Um, real numbers, which are sort of most present in, uh, say, uh, elementary education. Q means the rationals. FP uh, will be actually important, so maybe I will say what FP is. This is the field with P elements. P is a prime number, so for example 5. Uh, and this is the set of all remainders of division of natural numbers by P. Yeah? And so this is a finite set, and we multiply these, when we add or multiply these numbers, we always take the remainder of the result uh, modulo the prime p. And there are also qp, these are p-adic numbers, I will not tell you what these are. Um, and so now the definition. An affine algebraic variety, uh, x over k, is the set of solutions of a system of polynomial equations. Um, and so I wrote a system of polynomial equations. So these fi's are polynomials in many variables xi. Um, so that's a fairly general object. So maybe let's look at an example of such an abstract thing. Don't worry about the, the, the asterisks. I will explain them later. Um, so here's an example from everybody knows uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from high school is the unit circle. Uh, so that's in the xy plane, I have the unit circle. So here's the point 1, 0. Here's the point 0, 1. And the equation for the circle is, is this one. OK? So, um, that's some well-known object. Um, but we can also consider uh, such, uh, well, basically arbitrary equations. So here is one uh, that's uh, a bit more interesting about this one. This one is kind of trivial. Uh, it's called the Fermat curve. Xn is given by the same equation, but the twos are replaced by n, where n is a fixed, uh, fixed integer. All right. Uh, so so um, to continue, um, so the point of this definition, I define this as a set, the set of solutions of this set of equations, but the solu I look at uh, the solutions over all possible bigger fields containing my uh, given field. So that's um, written there. Uh, I look at all, so K is my field, and it's contained in some bigger field L. So for example, the reals are contained in 
the complex numbers. Um, and then I look at x of L, uh, which is the set of solutions of my system of equations where the, the, the variables are in L. And so we will see in a bit that really that the power of this theory is looking at solutions over different fields. This is not a technical point. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is actually important. So let's look at examples. So um, we are looking at our Fermat curve. Um, so that's given by this equation xn plus yn equals 1. So now the first example is I look at x2 of r. So it's x2 means that x squared plus y squared equals 1 over the real. So I already gave you this example. That's the unit circle. Everybody knows the unit circle. Um, and uh, now let's look at the solutions to the same equation, but where x and y are rationals. Um, so for example, so I, as I wrote there, that's related to this number theoretic problem of finding Pythagorean triples. So what is, what is a Pythagorean triple? Um, that's a tri triple of integers uh, whose squares of two add to the third. So everybody knows probably this. This Pythagorean triple, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. Um, so that's a Pythagorean triple. And that gives you a point, a rational point on this, uh, this, this variety. So 3 over 5 squared. I divided the same equation by 25. So now the sum of these squares of these two rational numbers equals 1. OK? Um, so now I could look also at the sort of rational points, so points with rational coefficients on this Fermat curve, and finding all of those, that's uh, precisely the statement of uh, the famous Fermat's last theorem about sums of nth powers which equal to an nth power. Um, now, uh, the most classical, from the point of view algebra of algebraic geometry case, if was, was when I look at complex uh, solutions, so co solutions in complex numbers. Uh, now, let's, let's think about the dimension. Um, so here I had two variables and one equation, so the set of solutions is one-dimensional, it's a curve. Now, if I look at the complex numbers, now a complex number is a, I mean the complex plane is a two-dimensional two thing. So now I expect this xn of c to be a surface. Um, so this surface, um, when I look at the, these solutions in complex numbers, that get, acquires some interesting geometry. So let me draw what I mean by a surface of genus g. So that's a surface that looks like this. Then here I have some dots. And so this has holes. And it has g many holes. And this number g is called the genus of, of this curve. Um, and in, in this case, this genus is given by this formula. Maybe I will not write the formula n minus 1 times n minus 2 divided by 2. That's not an important point. Um, but this is that's the picture that it, this is what it, this thing looks like. Um, and now uh, the, 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 the fun thing is that I can also, that's the, the last bullet point, uh, I can uh, look at the solutions over this finite field, this finite field FP with P elements that was here uh, on the board. And now I have only finitely many values for the xi. So this result of this, uh, I mean, the, the set of solutions is a finite set. I can count how many points it has. Um, in this particular case where I look at x3, uh, so a cubic curve, that's an elliptic curve, and the set of solutions has the structure of a finite abelian group. And these groups are actually used in uh, like everyday life uh, in cryptography. Maybe not this particular one, but maybe for a different slightly different equation, OK? Um, OK, so I explained what an affine algebraic variety is. You remember there was this, this word affine in the definition. Um, so affine here means small. So um, it's somehow that we are building bigger objects from smaller 
algebraic variety. So a general algebraic variety is something which is glued from these affine ones. Uh, I cannot explain precisely what that means, uh, but here is a, the sort of the crucial example. Uh, these are projective varieties. So now I look at solutions to homogeneous equations. Um, so I, here I homogenize my equation. So x n bar, I change this 1 to the right to be a z to the n. I added a new variable, and now I have an equation where all the terms have the same degree n. And as, uh, just as I said, that's our, my previous x n that I had plus a point in infinity. So that this new variety lies in what's called a projective plane. Um, by, so I'm looking, projective things come from affine things by adding some points at infinity. That's the way one should think about them. OK, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, algebraic varieties. And now we are going to look at the topology of these algebraic varieties. So a typical topological question is, I look at this set of complex solutions. Now that's a nice topological space. It's a geometric object. I can, for example, count how many holes it has. Uh, so that's the genus. Um, and that's a topological invariant of my algebraic variety. Uh, so here is a, sort of the paradigm that we use in algebraic topology. Um, so that's a different field of mathematics that we are going to sort of apply uh, in algebraic geometry. I take a nice topological space. So for example, a manifold. So if you don't know what a manifold is, uh, this is a manifold. Okay? Uh, and we attach to it algebraic invariants. And here are some, some uh, there is some notation there. Uh, it's not very important. Uh, so maybe let me that just give names to these guys. Uh, that's pi one of them, that's called the fundamental group. I will tell you a little bit about the fundamental group. There is this homology groups, cohomology groups. These are all algebraic objects that are attached to a geometric object. Algebra is easier than geometry, that's the, that's the idea. So for example, well, I will give you an example right now. Um, so let me talk about a little bit about the fundamental group. Um, so the fundamental group uh, of, uh, of a topological space is the space of loops uh, on the space uh, up to homotopy. So maybe let me draw you a picture again. Um, OK, so here's my space. Um, and I, that's my M. And I pick a base point. Maybe it has a hole. It, it will be more interesting if it looks like that. Um, and I pick some point x. That's my point little x. Um, and now I look at all loops on this M uh, based at this point. So I s the loop looks like this. I start at this point, and I go somewhere, and then come, come back. It's a directed loop. OK? And I consider these loops up to homotopies, which means sort of up to wiggling. So maybe this loop and the loop that looks, goes like this is obtained by a sort of a continuous pass it from one to the other, they are com considered equivalent. And that's a group because if I have one loop like this and another one maybe like, like that, <coughs> I can compose them by going one, first one way and then the other, the, the afterwards uh, following the, the other loop. Um, so that's a group attached to a topological space. Um, and so for example, here is, uh, an example, the fundamental group of the two torus. So the two torus is, is this guy, the surface of genus 1. Um, the fundamental group is just two copies of the integers. So one copy of the in integers is sort of generated by going around the, uh, the torus in this way. And the other is if I go around the torus and this other way. These are the two basic loops that exist on the torus. So you see, two copies of the integers are maybe an easier object to study than this uh, geometric thing, the two torus. OK, um, so now 
we are going to apply algebraic topology and algebraic geometry. So now I have my, remember that I always work over some field k, which may, may be rationals or real numbers. So I suppose that this is a field that's contained in the field of complex numbers. Um, so now I start with an algebraic variety over k, and I look at the solutions over the complex numbers. So maybe my x was this xn, and then, then xn of, of c looks like this. OK? Um, so that's now a nice topological space. And then I can apply this machinery of algebraic topology, so of attaching algebraic uh, invariants uh, to, uh, to my m. Um, and then I get, get these invariants of my algebraic variety. So, um, so m, m there on the right should be this x of c set of complex solutions. So here is an example. Um, I take this uh, cubic curve, uh, this cubic Fermat curve, and uh, x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed. Um, and then this, the set of solutions is a two torus. And so the fundamental group is z cross z. We already saw that. And using this knowledge, you can sort of understand uh, your object better, maybe. As, as a quotient of the complex numbers by, by something called the lattice. Maybe that's not, not an important point here. Um, OK, so now I will um, explain why this is uh, for many reasons, especially reasons related to number theory, not the right approach. Um, so one is that I have my field K. Um, so, and my field K may be embedded in the complex numbers in multiple ways. Um, and so I get some set of solutions over the complex numbers that depends on the choice of this uh, embedding of my field into the complex numbers. Um, so the, for, for a number theorist, for somebody who studies number theory, that's sort of an obvious drawback because what these people like is the action of this Galois group of, of the field. So that's a field of, uh, uh, that's a group of symmetries of all bigger fields uh, uh, above a given one. Um, and so that, that this Galois group, this mysterious object that everybody wants to uh, like understand better, it does not sort of operate on these algebraic invariants defined this way. So that's a problem. And uh, sort of another obvious, uh, really, problem is that some fields cannot be, um, cannot be embedded as a subfield of the complex numbers. So for example, the finite field, the field with p elements, in that field, if I add 1 to itself a number of times, I get 0. And that cannot happen in the complex numbers. And so that field is not the subfield of the complex numbers. It's what's called a field of positive characteristic. So this explains a positive characteristic in the title of the talk. And so what I could uh, do in principle, it starts with such an algebraic variety over this, this field and try to somehow, in a precise sense, lift it to uh, two complex numbers. And uh, uh, that's an exam another example due to Jean-Pierre Serre uh, that this is not always possible. So these are really drawbacks of this approach. And the problem is that we want to have these uh, topological invariants like the fundamental group or cohomology groups and uh, all of these other invariants that I will not name. Uh, we want to define them algebraically. So here the definition was not very algebraic because it was obtained by going to complex numbers and using some kind of analysis or something like that. So we need to cheat and uh, sort of define these things uh, uh, in, a, in a sort of direct way. Um, so so, so the, the solution uh, to, this, uh, to this problem uh, came in the late 60s. Uh, by the work of uh, Grothendieck and uh, uh, Artin and Maser. And this is called the et al. topology. And uh, 
the, the entire field is called the et al. homotopy theory. This is an algebraic replacement for algebraic topology that we like in algebraic geometry. So in particular, one of these invariants is the et al. fundamental group. Um, so that's sort of, sort of an algebraic variant of what we were doing here, except that you cannot anymore in this algebraic sense talk about these loops. They don't make any sense anymore. So it's actually quite tricky to, def to define. Um, and so this et al. fundamental group, that's what's called a profinite group. So that's a, a topological group that looks a bit like a counter set. Or it's a group that's somehow in some way built from finite groups. Um, I will not define precisely what the profinite group is, but it's a somehow a complicated object, but still manageable. Um, and for complex numbers, this resembles what we have defined before. Um, so it's as, as I wrote, as, as, as close as possible uh, to this topological fundamental group, so the one defined using loops. Uh, but for, say, for k being the rationals, it carries a really a very uh, intricate action of the Galois group. Um, and so in particular, it, it's expected to help us with finding rational points on an algebraic curve. So it was uh, sort of the deep, one of the deepest problems in number theory. OK, um, so now I uh, will finally explain the, the, the title of the talk, which was uh, topology of uh, algebraic varieties in positive characteristic. And so now I will tell you, like, all of this was quite old, and I will tell you something about some things that are new. Um, so now we work with fields with, uh, of uh, positive characteristics. So this is a field in which when I add 1 to itself a number of times, namely p times, I get 0. So for example, this field fp or any field that is bigger than fp. Um, and now I fix an, algebra an affine algebraic variety over k. So the thing that we've defined as a set of solutions of a system of polynomial equations with coefficients in that, in that field. And now the, the, the problem uh, that we encounter is that this topology, this et al. Uh, homotopy th theory business, in these situations become, becomes extremely complicated. Um, so I will give you an example, and I will give you the, the only sort of short calculation, uh, the sort of, of calculus type in this talk. Uh, so this is called the uh, Artin Schreier covering. If, if you want to remember one thing from this talk, let, let it be the Artin Schreier covering. Um, so uh, let me erase this thing because this doesn't make sense anymore in this positive characteristic um, situation. Um, so now we are considering x to be the line. So the line means we have one variable and no equations. Right? So that's what we call a line. And now we have a map from the line to itself. It's called f. a1, k, to, well, I mean, this, this, I don't like this notation. This is a very complicated notation to denote the line, right? Um, and so this map is given on this co in this coordinate x by this x minus x to power p. Uh, and this is very funny because when I look at the derivative of this polynomial, right? I mean, as we do in a, in, in, in a calculus course, um, so f prime of x, which is dx, df over dx, well, I differentiate, so let's do this one calculation. 1, that's the derivative of x, and then x to the p, so this is p times x to power p minus 1, right? OK, so far so good. But aha, this p is 0 in my field because I'm doing a calculation in my field in which p is 0. So the, this derivative of this polynomial is identically equal to 1. Let me put an exclamation mark here. Um, so OK, so, so what? Um, this means that the derivative of this polynomial does not vanish anywhere. And what that means is that this a1, this map from a1 to a1 is what's called a p, p fold covering space. Over every point, the, pre, um, 
when I look at all points that map to a given point here, there is exactly P of them. Um, so this is a, what's called a p-fold covering space. And what that implies in this et al. Uh, fundamental group business is that this, this group is non-trivial. But for a line, say, over complex numbers, we definitely think that every sort of loop in the complex plane can be contracted to a point. So there are, there are no non-trivial loops on, on the plane. Um, so so, so that that's, uh, shows us that actually something strange is uh, going on. And in fact, this group is very, very complicated. So uh, here are some more recent results. So, so you can show that this, this uh, group is very, very large, what's called not topologically finitely generated. Um, and then there is this theorem of Renault, which was a, a long-standing conjecture of Abiancar, uh, shows that basically all, uh, almost all finite groups are a quotient of this group. So this group is ex like too complicated to comprehend. Um, and the recent result uh, of Holzbach, Schmidt, and Sticks uh, shows that no algebraic varieties and positive characteristic other than a point have trivial topology. There are, I mean, all of them are very sort of complicated. Um, OK, and so somehow here is a new sort of insight, is that there is this fundamental group. There is this, this business that is weird. And the insight is that the this is sort of the entire uh, problem, that when we go past, beyond, try to understand this alge algebraic topology beyond uh, this, this fundamental group. There is nothing, nothing else that's weird. Um, and this comes from this phenomenon called wild ramification that I will tell you nothing about. Um, OK, so now here is, here is a result that I proved. Um, it says that every affine variety over a field of characteristic P, so of positive characteristic, is a k pi 1 space. Um, so let me explain what a k pi 1 space is. And what that says is basically what I said before, that the only non-trivial topological invariant is the fundamental group. Um, so one can define not only the fundamental group, pi 1. I mean, if there's a 1, you think that sh there should be 2 and so on. And indeed, there exist higher homotopy groups, pi 2, pi 3, and so on. And th what the theorem says is that all of these higher groups are actually 0. And so this means that the, the sort of the topology of this space is completely determined by, by what happens with this one, one algebraic vari invariant. We expect that this pi 1 is actually a complete invariant. So it's, if I have two varieties and they have the same fundamental group, then they are the same variety. Um, and here I wrote something about the steps of the proof, uh, but uh, maybe uh, I will, I will skip, um, uh, skip the words about the proof. Uh, but uh, let me remark that this, this, this uh, theorem, this is something that doesn't happen too often in mathematics, that we discover something that we didn't expect to be true before. It's either we do some uh, maybe simulation, computer simulation, and we predict something to be true. For example, this is what, what we have with the, uh, say, Riemann hypothesis that... Uh, Riemann expected something to be true about the Riemann zeta function. Nobody knows how to prove this. Or finally, somebody gets the idea. And here in, the, in this example of this theorem, it's something that wasn't uh, really expected before it uh, was proved. So um, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a bit unusual, I think. OK, um, that's all I uh, wanted to tell you about. <laughs> Thank you.